sense of hope for my circumstances. I may not know how to pray for them. Right? I may not have all the answers. I don't know where those things are going or, or how it's going to work in the midst of them. But man, if I know Jesus is praying for those circumstances I've involved in, all of a sudden, that, I think, wow, this is not as hopeless as I thought. God knows. God's involved in our daily lives. It's Christ's saving work. It's, it's what he died on the cross to make possible in, our, in the past, to make possible in our present. Man, you can put that on. That can be a helmet that can protect you from all sorts of kinds of, of doubts that come your way. Don't doubt his heart. Don't doubt his willingness to provide for you. He's praying for you. His plan is good. He is active and at work. Don't doubt him. Put on your helmet, right? Your Savior is caring for you. Hmm. If it isn't distractions and it isn't doubts, maybe what you battle with is discouragements. But you've got to know that Christ's saving work assures our hope. In Ephesians chapter 3, we read, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. You see, people in Paul's day were looking at Paul saying, if that's what it means to live the Christian life, I'm not sure I want it. Look how difficult he's had it. He's been in prison. He's been beaten. He's been shipwrecked. He's, he's been, you know, slandered. Life has not been great for Paul. And you want me to join you on that quest? And Paul says, yes, I do. Because of the hope in front of us. He said, don't lose hold of your hope. God, your Savior, the one who died in the past, who's at work now, has so much more for you. And you need all three of those things. You need a sense of his place in your past, where he has paid for your sins. But you need a responsiveness in the present, where you live for him. And you need a hope that is able to stand up to every circumstance of life. Paul had a a young minister, friend of his, that he had placed in ministry. His name was Timothy. And Timothy, as we read Paul's letters to Timothy, had a pretty difficult assignment in those days. He was young, and clearly he felt inadequate and unprepared for his task. You ever feel like that, that you're just a little unprepared for the challenges you're facing today? Timothy was unwell. Some kind of stomach problems going on. He, he just didn't quite feel physically up to the task that he was facing. And he was facing some difficult people. Some group of false teachers within his ministry were convinced that they knew better than God <laughs> what life was supposed to look like. But they... They could enhance God's grace with a set of their own rules. Not only that, but there seems to be just a little hint in his letters that, well, being associated with Paul wasn't always the easiest thing. That Paul himself could write a really good letter, but when he came, he was unimpressive himself. And his association with Paul could have been a bit of a challenge for Timothy if he just wouldn't have kind of that baggage with Paul. Things might have been easier for him. And the people he were dealing with were real people, easily distracted by temptations, difficult to lead, and a little willful and unengaged. And Paul addresses each one of those concerns but finally, he concludes with this piece of advice. And he says to them, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. There's a future hope, a future salvation that draws them on that says, don't give up. Don't let discouragement win. Don't finally say, well, phooey, if it's going to be this much work, Put on your helmet of salvation. 
put it on and say, I am going to live for this. I know my Savior lives and he lives for me and he has a hope and a future, a help and a presence. He has what I, what I need. That kind of discouragement, yeah, those kind of doubts, even those distractions are nothing new for God's people. In the very beginning of time, right? You go to the Garden of Eden, follow through with God's people. Isaiah himself looked at the people around him, brought God's word of encouragement to them for them not to give up. He says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary. He will not grow tired and his understanding no one can fathom. But he gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Don't give up. But on your helmet of salvation, know that the God who loved you enough to send his son to pay the price for your sins, is present help in our times of trouble and has a hope and a future for you. Love him with your whole heart. Say no to those sins that want to diminish and destroy. Learn to listen to him. Get engaged with God's word. Let, let your hearts respond to what hit warms his heart. Don't be lukewarm. Put on your helmet of salvation and place your hope in his word, in his promise. Live a life of love for God and others. It's critical. It's critical that salvation be not just something in your past, but a reality in your present and the hope for your future. It's your helmet. It's what protects your head. It's the helmet of salvation. So I say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? Because your salvation is guaranteed by the sacrifice of Christ's Son. The promise of his involvement in your heart is made because he is the living Lord, and his word guarantees your future. You have been saved if you have come to him, and if you've put your trust in him. Have you done that? Have you finally surrendered and said, Lord, I realize that Christ purchased my salvation, and only by his activity is there any forgiveness, and you say, yes, that's what I want. I want to be yours. I want your salvation. Have you looked at today's life and you say, Lord, I want you to be active in my heart and life today. I want your saving work to direct my steps. I not only want justification, I want that sanctifying work of yours in my life. I want my life to look like your life as your influence grows over my heart. And I want the hope of what you're going to do to be what stirs my heart that invites my hope that nothing can diminish. Well, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you are an amazing, saving God. And that the work which you have begun, you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And Lord, today we, we look at your saving Savior. And Lord, as best as we're able, we receive that work. Lord, maybe there's someone here who's never received you as their Savior for the very first time and misses it for them. They say, yeah, I see it. I want it. I, I accept that gift for each of us who's made that step, the continuing responses. Just as necessary, Father, you know each heart. For those that are here today and are discouraged, Maybe they're just a little disillusioned or struggling with doubts. Lord, I pray that 
the reality of your salvation can give them an anchor, an anchor for their soul that enables them to navigate through the difficulties that trusts your heart and your word that becomes for us the direction of our lives. Lord, would you help us to deal honestly with where we are and to fix our hope on you. In your name I pray. Amen. Put on the helmet of salvation. It's a short verse. <laughs> There's a lot there for us. Perhaps if I've talked about this today, there's been some area of struggle that you just said, well, just, we could just talk about it a little bit more. We could just listen to what salvation means in my circumstances. If that's you, and there's a way I can be an encouragement to you, just take one of the information cards in the pew in front of you and just put your name and how best to get a hold of you and just say, hey, let's talk. And I'd be happy to follow up and see how I can be an encouragement to you. As we close our service this morning, let me invite you to take your hymnals, and we're going to sing number, hymn number 467, Since I Have Been Redeemed. Number 467. Why don't you stand? I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him. Be glory in the church and in all generations forever and ever. Amen. May you go in peace.